Let us worship the Lord. And as we begin our worship, we do so singing in the words of Psalm 45, the first version of the psalm. Stephen, would you? Psalm 45, the first version of the psalm. And we're going to sing from the beginning. We're going to sing verses one to six. <clears throat> My heart brings forth a goodly thing. My words that I indict concern the king. My tongue's a pen of one that's swift of right. He's going to speak about the king, about the Lord. And... Uh, his, his tongue, he says, is like the pen of a ready writer, quick and swift. And here's what he has to say. Thou fairer art than sons of men. Into thy lips is store of grace infused. God therefore be blessed forevermore. O thou that art the mighty one, thy sword gird on thy thigh. Even with thy glory excellent and with thy majesty. For meekness, truth, and righteousness in state ride prosperously. And thy right hand shall thee instruct in things that fear for thee. Thine arrows sharply pierce the heart of the enemies of the king. And under thy subjection the people down do bring forever and forever. Is, O oh God, thy throne of might, the scepter of thy kingdom, is a scepter that is right. Verses that glorify the Lord and verses in which we see glimpses of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one who is fairer than the sons of men, although he took human nature. Yet there is in him uh, an unsullied holiness and a divine majesty that puts him entirely apart. 45, the first verse in one through six, my heart is forth a goodly thing. My heart is Oh. 
we come before the Lord in prayer. The scepter of thy kingdom is a scepter that is right. We give thanks today that the Lord has the scepter and the throne and the authority and that in his grace he calls us to worship. We stand in a long line of worshiping people all the way back to Adam who worshipped first of all in a state of innocence where there was no barrier between himself and his God. But because Adam changed and became sinful, a barrier was erected. But even then there was a way to come through the shedding of blood and through an intermediary. And we follow in these footsteps today. Give us a spirit of worship so that we will feel when we go home that we have been in worship. So that this moment, these minutes, this hour will be special and different and unique, set apart from everything else that we do in the ordinary week of life. That we will be humbled in the presence of God, awed in the presence of his glory, penitent in the presence of his holiness, encouraged in the presence of his grace and his goodness, drawn to him, sitting at his feet, hearing his word, obeying his voice. May thy spirit come, O Lord, that today such will be our response to the word to the preaching of the word, to the challenge of the word. We pray thy blessing then, Lord, upon each one of us. We come, many of us, as family groups. We come, all of us, as a community of worshiping people. And yet we are one, set apart, and each one of us has to do with God. Grant, Lord, that today our worship would be very personal, very intimate, that we would have a sense of ourselves standing before and meeting with Almighty God, that our hearts will be touched, warmed, and drawn by the Holy Spirit. We pray, Lord, for all who name the name of Christ and whose trust is in him, that they would know blessing this Lord's day, that they would be sanctified by the truth and directed by the word, that they would find food for their souls, that they would find direction for life, that they would find answers to their issues, that if they are cold, they would be warmed, if they are under temptation, they would be enabled to resist the devil and find him fleeing from them. Pray for any who are searching and seeking. We pray, Lord, that they would find and that they would be found. We pray for those who are cold and apathetic and generally disinterested. We pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would be at work so that we would see transformation in homes and families, in hearts and lives and souls, in young, in middle-aged, in old. We pray for those in our families who have little concern and little interest in spiritual things. 
pray, Lord, that we would see the hand of God at work and that God would have mercy upon their souls. We pray for those who are away from home, at work or in study, in land or in sea. We commit them all, O oh Lord, to thyself and pray that even today, perhaps they have forgotten some of the ways things used to be, but we pray that even today something of the gospel and something of the claims of Christ would break into the world and into their lives. We do pray, eternal Lord, for each one of us then and all that we bring before thee. We pray for those who are unwell. We pray for healing and progress. We pray for the many who have still laid down with COVID. We pray for the many who have multitude of other ailments and problems in body and mind. We pray for healing. We pray for help. We pray for blessing in the midst of difficulty and to come out of difficulty. We pray for patience in the midst of all of these things. We pray, Lord, for the work of the gospel among us, our own congregation. We pray for Mr. Morrison as he hopes to join us this coming week. Grant, Lord, that doors and hearts would be opened and that the literature that will be distributed might know the benediction of heaven upon it. Except the Lord build the city, the builders lose their labor and labor in vain. We pray for the wider work of the denomination in our own presbytery and in all the presbyteries of the church at home and in other parts of the world. We pray for the work of the gospel beyond our borders, for all who preach Christ and him crucified, for all who are engaged in the evangelism of the world, Jew and Gentile. We pray for those who feel the heal and the force and the weight of persecution and all its cruelty. Those for whom service to Christ and loyalty to him comes at the most appalling price. Oh Lord, we pray for every such, some of them even known to ourselves, who are imprisoned for their faith, who have had to flee country and kith and kin for their love and loyalty to Christ. How we know that at the end, the Lord is no man's debtor, but these things are hard. They are hard for flesh and blood, and they are hard for the spirit as well. Maintain such that they would not be overwhelmed by their circumstances and discouraged that the enemy who will taunt and mock with all his cruelty will not gain the upper hand upon them, but that they will be able to say that when they are weak, then they are strong, and that they will discover, as the apostle did with his thorn in the flesh, that God's grace was sufficient for him. We pray, Lord, for our nation in the midst of the difficulties, the multitude of difficulties which face us. We pray for the Queen, especially today as she reaches a historic milestone in her life and in the life of the nation. We give thanks for these 70 years of service and uh, the uh, undoubted uh, keeping of God's hand uh, upon us in so many ways. We we grumble and we complain, but we have many reasons to be thankful. We have known much by way of peace and stability that other nations eh, can only wish for. We pray then for her today, and we pray that as she ponders this milestone in her life, it would be blessed to her in her own soul. Remember the prime minister and our first minister. We pray for all in positions of authority that they would come to realize that the Lord is not merely to be acknowledged occasionally and to be granted some sort of place on the periphery of life, but that they would come to realize that he must be at the center, at the center of their planning, at the center of all that they promote, at the center of their own uh, work, for unless he is, then how can we know blessing? Lord, we pray that we would be turned, that we would repent of our sin. We are, as a nation, we are like the prodigal son who has gone far away. And we, are, we have many in the nation who, like the lost coin, are lost in the dust and in the rubbish of this world. We pray, Lord, for a divine sweeping, that lost coins would be found. We pray for a divine calling that lost sons and lost daughters too would be found and called back by God's grace. 
that we would see them repenting of sin and forsaking sin and making their way back to the Father's house and that they would find there his goodness, his compassion and his extravagant generous, eh, generosity reaching down to themselves. O oh Lord, thou art able to do it and beyond our thinking and beyond our asking. Stir up thy spirit, Lord, we pray. Stir us up in prayer. Stir us up in earnestness and spiritual things. Forgive us our apathy, our half-heartedness. Forgive us our coldness. Forgive us our lack of holiness. Forgive us our lack of concern about our lack of holiness. But give us, Lord, we pray, a true, a true zeal in our souls, a true following after Christ, a true loyalty for him. Pardon us our, our pride, our self-sufficiency. Pardon us our lack of love and our lack of faith, the dimness of our hope, the weakness of our witness, the covetousness of our hearts. O oh Lord, we pray for mercy and grace. We pray for the blood of Christ to cover sin and his grace to reach us. Hear us, be with us as we handle the word. Go before us in all that we do and cleanse it and receive it only for Jesus' sake. Amen. We're going to read together now in two passages, both of them in the New Testament and both of them in the Gospels. The first of them in the Gospel according to Matthew, and we're going to read in chapter 3, and we're going to commence our reading at verse 13, and we'll read on into chapter 4, and then we'll read in Mark's Gospel, where we have a, a very similar narrative, but you'll notice, and I'll mention that later on as well, that where Mark gives us a very summarized version of the events. Matthew's account is that bit longer. Matthew's gospel is longer anyway. It's, it's, um, it's 12 chapters longer than Mark's gospel. And it generally contains, on many of these instances, a good deal more detail than the other one. So Matthew chapter 3, reading from verse 13. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee, to Jordan, to John, to be baptized of him. John is obviously John the Baptist, of course. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said to him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him, but John was happy to be baptized and to baptize the Lord and Jesus when he was baptized went out straightway out of the water and lo the heavens were opened to him and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him and a voice from heaven saying this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hunger. And when the tempter came to him, he said, Thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and saith to him, Thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again the devil taketh them up into an exceeding high mountain 
and show them all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. He saith to him, all these things will I give thee. If thou wilt fall down and worship me, he's getting more and more bold and more and more daring. And saith Jesus unto him, get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. And now in the gospel according to Mark in chapter 1, last Lord's Day, we began a series of sermons in this gospel, and we looked at verses 1 to 8. But we can read them again just to preserve the context. <clears throat> the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 1, reading from verse 1. The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And there went out to him all the land of Judea and they of Jerusalem and were all baptized of him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. And John was clothed with camel's hair with a girdle of skin about his loins, and he did eat locusts and wild honey. John was a desert dweller and preached, saying, There cometh one mightier after I. There cometh one mightier than I after me, the lad should of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John and Jordan. And straightway coming out of the water, he saw the heavens open and the Spirit like a dove descending upon him. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And immediately the spirit driveth him into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted of Satan, and was with the wild beasts. And the angels ministered unto him. And so on, we trust the Lord to follow with his own blessing that reading of his holy and inerrant word of truth. We're going to sing again now in Psalm 2. Psalm 2, and we're going to sing from the beginning of the psalm. We'll sing down to verse 8. <clears throat> now, this is one of these psalms, so many of them that speak prophetically of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's written way back in the heart of the Old Testament, but it's quoted in the New Testament and applied explicitly to the Lord Jesus Christ. But it begins with a picture of man's rebellion. Why rage the heathen and vain things? Why do the people mind? Kings of the earth do set themselves and Princes are combined to plot against the Lord and his anointed, saying thus, let us asunder break their bands and cast their cords from us. And then we have the divine response. He that in heaven sits shall laugh. The Lord shall scorn them all. It's not a laugh of uh, delight. It's a, it's a laugh of derision. Then shall he speak to them in wrath. In rage he vex them shall. 
And here's what he says. Yet, notwithstanding, notwithstanding everything in verse 1, 2, and 3, notwithstanding, I have him to be my king appointed. And over Zion, my holy hill, I have him king anointed. Now, as I said, this is referring to the Lord Jesus Christ, who we see in, in, in later scriptures as a king of kings and the Lord of lords. The sure decree I will declare. The Lord hath said to me, thou art mine only son. So not just an echo of what we, we, we saw there at Jesus' baptism, the voice from heaven. Thou art mine only son. This day I have begotten. Ask of me, and for heritage, the heath and I'll make thine. And for possession, I to thee will give earth's utmost line. Psalm 2, 1 through 8. Why rage the heathen? Why rage the
friends, seeking the light and leading of God's Spirit, we turn again to God's Word and to the second of these passages that we read, the Gospel according to Mark in chapter 1. Last Lord's Day, we began studying together this part of God's Word, and we looked at the first eight verses. We come this morning to verse 9. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in Jordan. And straightway coming out of the water, he saw the heavens open and the spirit like a dove descending upon him. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And immediately the spirit driveth him into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted of Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered unto him. <clears throat> now, I'm sure that all of us have got at home old picture albums. And you can take them out and you can look at the pictures and they would have captured just a moment in time. And you look back at the picture and you think of what happened that day and the events of that day, whatever event it was. Well, the verses that I just read capture for us three moments in the life and the ministry of our Lord. And like the snapshot, like the picture you have at home, Mark here just captures the, the bare detail. If we want a fuller account of what happened at the baptism and at his temptation in the wilderness, we have to go to the other Gospels, and that's why we read this morning as well in Matthew 3 and 4, because Matthew gives us a much more expanded account of what we have here. But I want this morning to follow Mark's brevity, really, as he deals with these things, and look at the three pictures that we have here, and although Mark's detail is not as great as Matthew's, there is more than enough here because these verses are full of teaching and instruction for us. And these verses, they capture so much about who Christ was and what Christ did. Well, can we look then at the three pictures that uh, Mark gives us here in these verses? And I want to begin, first of all, with what I'm going to call the surprising picture. The surprising picture. And you'll find this one in verse 9. It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Galilee, Nazareth of Galilee, and was baptized of John and Jordan. We are here with John the Baptist down by the river. And as we saw last week, many, many people were gathering there. All sorts of people. But suddenly, one day, he comes suddenly there he is, the long-promised, the long-awaited Savior. He had been born some 30 years before at Bethlehem, and we get tiny little details about his childhood, a glimpse of him at 12, and pretty much silence for the rest. But now here he is, emerging from the obscurity of Nazareth. And he's beginning here his public ministry. And he begins that public ministry 
by coming to John for baptism. And that, friends, should surprise us. Now, why should it surprise us? Well, what did that baptism of John symbolize? What does baptism generally symbolize? Well, what do you use water for? Children, why do you use water apart from drinking it? What's the other main use we have for it? Well, you use water to wash, don't you? Your hands are dirty, your face is dirty. You put it under the water and the water washes it away. And those who came to the river to be baptized by John, they were, they were confessing. They were saying, we're not clean. Our lives aren't clean. Our lives haven't been clean as they should in our own sight. Never mind the sight of God. Our lives have been so unclean and so full of filth and pollution, so full of sin. They were saying as they came, we need to be washed, not washed outwardly in our bodies, of course. They were saying far more than that. We need to be washed in our hearts and washed in our souls. We understand how that applies to all these other people. But along comes Jesus. And he says to John, I too want to be baptized. But why should that surprise us? Well, children, you know why. Because he was holy, pure, without filthy, unclean heart, holy, harmless, and undefiled. And yet here he is, and he's coming as if he too had sinned to wash away. Why? Well, Isaiah had said, centuries and centuries before that one day when he would come he would be numbered with the transgressors that he would be identified with included amongst sinners now he was at calvary of course he was numbered with the transgressors there but he was numbered with them long before calvary he was numbered with them here at the River Jordan as he came for baptism. Jesus, the holy, spotless Son of God, is standing here at Jordan with sinners and identifying himself with them. He's saying, I have come. I have come to stand where sinners stand. I have come to receive what they should receive. Not because he had sin of his own, of course not. But he was carrying the sin of his people, wasn't he? He was their substitute. He was their representative. And the sin of his people Became his sin. The guilt of his people. Became his guilt. He laid on him. It says in Isaiah 53. The iniquity. The iniquity. Laid on him. That belonged to his people. It's transferred to him. He takes their guilt. Their shame. Their curse. Their penalty. Oh, he's going to do it at Calvary. But he's doing it here. At the very, very beginning of his ministry. 
The water of baptism is a way of saying we need to be washed from our sins. He has no sins of his own, but he says, I'm carrying the sins of my people. This is a surprising picture. Many years ago in the United States, there was a young man in court. He'd, he'd done something very bad. And he'd been found guilty of whatever crime it was. And the judge said to him, he said, before I sentence you, have you anything to say? Young man, he had nothing really to say. But suddenly, suddenly the man's father, he stood up in the court and he said, your honor, he said, we have nothing to say. The verdict is against us and the verdict is just. We can only ask for mercy. Now, did you notice what the father said there? It's we, we, we. It's not he and it's not him. Now, the old man, he wasn't guilty of anything. He had broken no law. But in that moment, he was identifying himself with his son. Such was his compassion. Such was his bond. It almost felt to him as though he was in the dock himself. It had come that close to him. But here is the sinless son of God. And he's going to put himself in the dock. He's going to put himself in the guilty place. He will voluntarily take that burden. And here he is at Jordan. And it's as if he's saying, we are guilty. I'm going to be judged by the law, he says. And I will be found guilty. Oh, this is a surprising picture. Here, long before Calvary, long before any miracles have been performed, before any one of the disciples has been called to him, at the very beginning, the very beginning of Mark's gospel, Jesus is already showing us why he had come into the world, already showing us what sort of savior he was going to be, already showing us what he was going to do. We're only nine verses into this gospel. And this is almost the first mention of Jesus in the gospel. The previous verses have been largely taken up with John the Baptist. Here at the very beginning, he is coming to John for baptism. Now, Mark doesn't tell us here how John argued with Jesus. We read about that in, in, in Matthew's gospel. He said, you don't have any sin to be washed away. John had an understanding of that. In fact, he said, if anything, I need to be baptized by you. But Jesus says to him, John, it has to be this way. This is why I came into the world. I came to be the sin bearer. And it's going to be seen symbolically here today, John. I must identify with the people I have come to save. I must be here today as their substitute. Because I'm going to take all their filthiness. It's going to fall on me. So here, nine verses into the gospel, we're already being taken to the very heart of Jesus's ministry. And we remember in Luke 12 that he spoke of another baptism, a baptism of death and a baptism of blood at Calvary. You know, in the Old Testament, before entering on his duties, the priest had to be anointed with oil, and he had to be washed with water. Well, here's our great high priest entering on his public duty. 
and he is washed symbolically. In his case, of course, there was purity. In his case, the outward cleanliness was matched by an inner cleanliness. And here's our great high priest. He is being washed. Oh, this is a surprising picture. But this surprising picture, it isn't just theology. It isn't just history. It isn't just a series of facts. It has huge practical application for every single one of us. Have you been washed? Has your sin and your guilt been washed away? Have you got a substitute, a savior who is sinless, but who has carried and borne your guilt? As Jesus stood in your place, in my place condemned, he stood, says the new wife, bearing shame and scoffing wood. Well, in a sense, is standing in your place. Didn't just happen at Calvary. He's identifying with you there. At the Jordan. You were on his heart there. Your great high priest. Do you have a savior? Have you been washed? And if not, why not? And if not, when not? When? Will you put a date on it? Will you make an appointment? A day when you will meet with God before whom we all have to do? When you will be washed and your guilt taken away and you will have peace with God? Will you put a date on it? What date will we put on it? What date will we write? Well, the only date we dare put on it is today. Because tomorrow's not promised. We have the surprising picture, but I must hurry. Because secondly, we have the solemn picture. And you'll find this in verses 10 and 11. Coming out of the water, he saw the heavens open, the spirit like a dove descending upon him. And then there's this voice from heaven. Now there are two parts to this solemn picture. First of all, they hear a voice in verse 11. Mark is telling us here at the very beginning of his gospel account that the Jesus he's going to write about in chapter 2 and chapter 3 and all the way to chapter 16. That he enjoyed the favor and the approval of his father. That is coming into this world. That is ministry. That what he had just done at the river Jordan. Had the blessing and the approval of heaven itself. God the father was glad. With all that was done at Jordan. Glad with all that was symbolized at Jordan. Because the Father and the Son and the Spirit, as we'll see in a minute, are all united in this work of redemption, in this saving work. It's not just Jesus coming into the world by himself. He and the Father are united in it. And the Spirit is united in it. Your redemption, my friend, is Trinitarian. All three are interested. All three are involved. Oh, what this says about the love and the mercy of God. What this says about the kindness of God. I ask again, will you set a date on the day when you will come to the Lord, when your sin is pardoned, that you might enjoy the blessing of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Because he looks at his people and he says, I'm well pleased with them. 
because I see them washed in Christ, united to Christ. I am well pleased. And that's a whole sermon in itself, which I, I mustn't go near just now. So they hear a voice, but they also see a dove. The spirit descends on the form of a dove. It didn't need to descend in any form. It could have descended invisibly because the spirit is a spirit, of course. But he chose on this occasion to give them an outward sign of what was happening. No, it wasn't that the Lord didn't have the spirit's presence up till now. But it was a sign that at the very beginning of his ministry, he was being particularly equipped for all that lay ahead. Here's the, the, the dove that all the way through scripture is so often a, a symbol of purity and gentleness and peaceableness. So we have the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And we're only 10 verses into the gospel. We have a redemption. And we're only 10 verses into the gospel. Now, some writers remind us at this point of another dove. Do you remember a dove in the Old Testament? Children, do you remember a dove in the Old Testament? One particular dove. Do you remember the dove at the ark? The dove that Noah sent out and it came back and it came back with something in its beak. That dove was a sign of a new beginning. That olive branch was a sign of new life. And the Lord is saying, this is the one through whom I will make a new beginning. The Lord Jesus Christ. Is that how it is for you? Have you had a new beginning because of Jesus? New beginning through Jesus. I will make new life. Now I said a moment ago that the priests of the Old Testament were washed and anointed. They were anointed with oil. Now the oil was a symbol of the Spirit. Here's our high priest. He's been washed symbolically. And now he's being anointed with a spirit above measure. Oh, the glory, the excellence, the, the attention to detail that we have here. Jesus has been commissioned. And heaven is putting its benediction on it all. We have a surprising picture. He comes for baptism. We have a solemn picture, the voice and the dove. Finally, we have a shocking picture. And you'll find this in 12 and 13. Immediately after the baptism and the joy and the, the power of that moment. He's led into the wilderness. Don't be surprised, Christian. If you are led into the wilderness at times. Don't be surprised if after great experiences and warm, encouraging moments. The devil comes and the wilderness comes. It was so for him. Now there's two things that mark mentions here as there in the wilderness the lord of creation was hungry and thirsty he mentions two things first of all he mentions the temptation now a couple of years ago we spent a few weeks looking at the temptation so all i can do just now is is mentioned and i'll say this much about it you remember in genesis 3 adam was tempted now, Adam, of course, was our representative, our covenant head. He represented us. What happened? Well, he failed. 
When he tempted, when he was tempted, he failed, and sin and judgment and death came. But here's the one that the Bible calls the second Adam, the last Adam. He's his people's representative. He's their substitute. He must be tempted. He must be tried. He must be tested too. And we know that that temptation was real. It was a part of his work and it was a part of his suffering. But now we know that he stood as only he could. He kept the law, Christian, as your representative. He was there looking after your interests at, at, at Jordan. He was there and you were there with him and in him. And he's there in the wilderness. He's still looking after your interests. He's keeping the law in your place. You're going to be clothed in his righteousness. And here he is, that righteousness being tested. Here he is keeping the law. Oh, if you're here today and you're not a Christian, you have no representative. You know, sometimes if people find themselves in real deep trouble, they might say, I want, I want a solicitor, I want a lawyer, I want, I want my legal representative. Or one day we'll stand before God. The Lord's people, they will have their legal representative. He's kept the law in their place. He's carried the filth and the dirt and the sin of their lives. And now they're justified. They're cleansed. But you're here today and you have no legal representative. So what do you have to do? Well, you have to try to keep the law yourself. There's, there's no other option. Either he keeps the law in your place or you keep it yourself. Can I ask how you're getting on? Let's just take today. Have you kept the law today perfectly? I know somebody who used to struggle with this before they were converted. And they would resolve every day to, to keep the law. They'd say, today I'm going to, to keep God's law perfect. But they had sufficient understanding to realize that before the day had gone very far, they hadn't kept the law. In fact, they would sometimes say, I haven't even got out of bed and I haven't kept the law yet. I'll have to try again tomorrow. Of course, tomorrow is just like today. And that's just such a good picture of it, isn't it? But the Bible doesn't tell you to keep the law. It tells you you can't keep the law. By the deeds of the law shall no flesh, no man, no woman be justified. It tells you to go to Christ who is your law keeper and your covenant keeper. And it tells you that he will transform you. And by his grace you will keep the law. And not bringing in some form of antinomianism here. I'm not saying Christian you don't need to keep God's law because Christ has kept it for you. You keep the law as a rule of life now. You've come to love the law. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the law as our standing before God. And the law has no mercy. God is full of mercy. It's, it's written all over these verses. The law has no mercy. Look into the law for mercy. You're looking in the wrong place. 
So he is tempted. But Mark has a second detail. And I must finish. You find it in verse 13. He was there with the wild animals. Now, why does Mark in such a short account mention that? He's, he's covered in five verses what, what, what Matthew took many verses to cover. Why does Mark tell us that he was with the wild beasts? Well, we know that Christ came as the second Adam. I've said that already. He came to undo what the first Adam did by his fall into sin. But to do that, he had to come into the world. Not as it was before Adam sinned, but as it was after Adam fell. Jesus is tempted. It's not like Adam when he was in the garden, surrounded by nice animals. Because the whole world was in a state of peace before sin came in. Everything got on with everything else. Nice animals over which he had control. No, Jesus is not in a garden. He's in a desert with wild animals. What a picture of the world he had come to. It was in a fallen, broken, dangerous, disintegrating world that Christ was tempted. It was into a broken, sinful, disintegrating world of wild beasts. Some of them on four legs and some of them on two. That's the sort of world he came to. And that's the sort of people he came to save. Because around the same time as Jesus was born, there was a man we know as Saul of Tarsus, and he was a wild beast. He would grow up to hate Christ, to do everything he could to silence those who named the name of Christ. He was a dangerous, violent man. But it was for such he came. And Saul of Tarsus would meet Jesus of Nazareth. Convicted of his sin. He would find forgiveness of his sin. And years later he would write of Jesus. As the son of God. Who loved me. And who gave himself. For me. Here's the second Adam in the wilderness of this world, surrounded by wild animals. But in that world, he would win back away to the tree of life, which the first Adam had lost on us. What a savior he is. If we're spared in coming weeks, as we go through Mark's gospel, we'll see all of this developed and expanded. But here in these five verses, we have three wonderful pictures of who he was and what he'd do. One of them is surprising. One of them is solemn and one of them is utterly shocking. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he were rich, for you sake, Christian, for you sake, he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be made rich. And God bless his word and his pray. Eternal Lord, we give thanks for all that we find in these verses, all that we see of Christ, our great high priest, washed and anointed, our great substitute, standing in line with sinners, numbered with them, reckoned as one of them. And yet with that heavenly benediction, 
coming through the wilderness, unspotted and unsullied, with the wild animals around him, many of them, men and women who would tear him to pieces. And yet out of them, he would call those who would be his own. Our sin makes us all wild beasts. We need to be transformed. May the Spirit do so today. And may we resolve to go not a day longer, trying to keep the law ourselves. May we go not a day longer without a legal representative who can plead on our behalf with such success in the court of heaven. Bless us, Lord, we pray. Be with us as we close. And throughout the day, help us to honor it as the Lord's day. And forgive us anything we said wrong. For Jesus' sake, amen. We're going to conclude singing in Psalm 51, friends. Alistair McLeod, Skidinish, would you lead us in the singing, please? Psalm 51, we're going to sing three verses from the beginning down to verse 4. After thy loving kindness, Lord, have mercy upon me. For thy compassion's great, blot out all mine iniquity and then you see what he's saying. This is what we were talking about. Me cleanse from sin and truly wash from mine iniquity. For my transgressions I confess. My sin I ever see. Down to verse 4. Three stanzas after thy loving kindness, Lord. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion and fellowship of God the Spirit, rest on and abide with you all, now and forevermore. Amen.